Welcome back, Game Theorists. Today we are still in Chapter 2, looking at elements of games. In the previous section, we looked at six considerations for thinking about games. So the elements of games are three things that every game has to have. Otherwise, we would not consider it a game, and we cannot use the tools of game theory. So element number one. The game has to have players. So have to be some participants involved in the game. It's pretty self-evident, so not a whole lot to say about that one. Games have to have strategies. Now, in game theory, I mean, this is going to be the, the options the players have. We'll make that definition more precise later on. So the players have to be able to do something in the game. That's a necessary element of a game. Our last element Games have to have payoffs. So it's going to be the utility that the players get from the outcome. So you learn about utility functions back in um, back in intermediate micro. You may have also seen them in principles of micro. So if a situation has those three elements of players, strategies, and payoffs, then you can model it as a game. Like I was saying last time, it's about much, much more than just board games. Lots of situations can be studied with this framework. So we talked about firms in competition are not playing a board game, but you can still use game theory to model that. We'll see many, many other examples of games that might not be considered traditional board games, but they can still be analyzed with these tools. So some of the tools we use for analysis, one of them is that we say players are rational. Now this word rational can be kind of confusing because it has a lot of different definitions. So there's the definition in plain English, which we are not using here. Economics has its own definition, and to make things even more confusing, I can think of, off the top of my head, at least three distinct definitions for rationality within economics. So there's rational that you learned about in um, microeconomics already. Macroeconomics has something they call rational expectations. Game theory rationality is something else entirely, so let's be clear what I mean by game theory rationality. So they can fully calculate the consequences of their actions, they can calculate what's going to happen, how the outcomes in the game, and they can maximize their payoff.
So we also say the players are rational, um, the term is rational ad infinitum. So here's the idea of what that means. So I'm rational and I know that you're rational and I know that you know that I'm rational and I know that you know that I know that I'm rational, etc. So this assumption has been challenged. I can't really defend the perfect calculation part. I don't think that is true or justifiable. You probably saw in our game we played earlier, our first in-class game, that there was something less than perfect calculation going on there. Now, the part of players trying to maximize their payoff, though, is defensible. Now, some folks have misconstrued this as being selfish, but that is not necessarily true at all. Alas, comes from the ignorant social science journalism where journalists who don't really understand economics nevertheless try to write about it anyways. And they say things like, it comes to assume people are rational, but that's not actually an assumption of economics at all. Unfortunately, I spent a decent chunk of my time in teaching economics, getting people to unlearn things that social science journalism has taught them. <laughs> so over here, the payoff is the utility you get from the outcome. So if somebody thinks that I would rather have $6 in the satisfaction of having helped someone, that can give me more utility than $6.05 if I had taken advantage of them. So maybe I feel good about myself if I am helping other players and cooperating, whereas if I take advantage of them, I might get more money, but my conscience will bother me if I do that. Because based on utility here, payoffs are utilities, not dollars, and utilities can depend upon cooperation and helping or hurting, then being selfish and being rational should not be confused as being the same thing. They're not always the same thing. So oftentimes, if this experience shows that game theory's predictions are not born out in the real world, it's often not really about the assumptions of gate theory being wrong, but rather about the payoffs being misspecified. So sure, this could definitely be true that I get more utility from cooperating even at the cost of getting a little bit less money, so cooperation is rational. The issue you face in an experimental laboratory is that we don't really observe how much happiness you get from being helpful. We also don't observe how much happiness you lose if you're just exploiting everybody. So as a simplification, we often set payoffs equal money, but that's not what the theory actually says. Payoffs are utility, not money. So a lot of these apparent contradictions are really just payoffs being mis misspecified, confusing payoffs with cash because we can't observe things like cooperation or exploitation, 
and how much that affects people's happiness. And we'll see many examples of this later on the course to look at some of the evidence in experimental games. So we'll talk more about that later. Now, another difficulty we sometimes face is that there can be risk involved in a game. Sometimes the outcome is not always certain. There can be an element of chance. The way we deal with that is by taking expected values. Now, because the paths are at least in theory, utilities, we're really taking expected utilities, so we know that's all valid from intermediate micro. If you can't observe utility, you take the cash outcome as being the payoff, which is not entirely accurate, we just saw, but if you do that because you have to, then take expected values. So you guys probably learned about expected value already back in intermediate micro, perhaps even in principles of micro, I'll just recap it very, very briefly here so we're all on the same page. So expected value is a weighted average of all possible outcomes. The weights are the probabilities. Um, for notation, uh, I wrote it up at this time because it's the first time I'm using this word in this class, but usually I'll just say prob for probability. You'll probably see me do that, or I should say, you'll prob see me do that a lot in the rest of the semester. So, for example, let's say you are rolling a die. And if you roll a 5 or a 6, you're going to win $15. And if you roll a 1, a 2, a three or a four, in that case, you're going to lose six dollars. We're going to find the expected value. Um, for other abbreviations, often just write EV for expected value. I do try not to go overboard with abbreviations, but EV is a very common one you'll see for expected value, not just in this class, but also in lots of other econ classes. Proper probability is also very universal. So I should say I try to avoid 
non-standard abbreviations, but things like prob and ev are things you, probably, you really do want to know because they're so common. All right, let's go find the expected value. So the probability of rolling a five or a six is, well, let's first find all the possible outcomes. So the possible outcomes are gain $15 and losing $6. And we want to take a weight of those and use the weights of the probabilities. So the probability of rolling a five or a six is two out of six. There are six sides to your die and they're all equally likely. So two out of six times you should see that happen. For the same reason you'll see this be, well, one through four is gonna happen four times out of six on average. So now I go calculate that. So um, two over six times 15 is gonna be 30 over six. And then we have four over six times six will be 24 over six, which is six over six, which is one. Let's say uh, one dollar. The interpretation is that if you're playing this game repeatedly, on average, you'd win $1 each time you play. Now, of course, each time you play, you'll actually win $1. You might win 15 or six or minus six, but over a long period of time, on average, you play it like say a thousand times, you probably win around a thousand dollars. Or if you play it 3,000 times, then you probably win 3,000 times one, which is $3,000, etc. Now your book adds another factor here. Your book says that we assume that players have common knowledge of the rules, so all players know all of the rules. You actually don't have to make that assumption. You could say with probability P, we all know the rules with probability one minus P, someone doesn't, so that's not actually necessary. So we wrap up with this last concept your book talks about equilibrium and we'll stay a little bit vague here because we are in the introduction. Equilibrium, loosely speaking, means all players are playing their best strategies. We'll make that more precise in the later chapters. So that wraps up our introduction, chapter two. Be sure to tune in for our next episode, chapter three, in which we learn about sequential games. Take care and safe Stay safe out there.